I'm looking the wrong direction. There we go. I hate it when I do that. Hey everybody. It's Russ of Aquarimax here. And we're going to be checking out some isopods first. This is my isopod morph mix colony. You can see here. It started out with Dalmatians and Spanish Orange. And it's got both of those. But it also has some normals and some calicos in here. This is what happens if you just put oranges and Dalmatians together. See, there's a nice example of a calico right in the middle of the screen there. And there are orange Dalmatians in here now, as well as the normal Dalmatians. There are quite a few different isopods of different persuasions, so to speak. Uh, so sometimes creating an isopod morph fairly easy. There's a good example of a orange Dalmatian. It's got a nice orange patch there. I like that one. There's another one happening by on the right. And there's a pretty good one here on the branch. So, yep, just left them together. When I did the experiment a few years ago, replicated someone else's experiment, I should say, of putting a uh, Spanish orange with Dalmatians and I, Ryan Orr was the first one to do it and I decided to try it myself and I of course isolated a lot of the orange Dalmatians but I did also leave a bunch together and this is what I got so this is a fun place too. Uh, there we go just a little look so I'm gonna take a look here Evan, Bull Cow, Jay Bear, oh thank you that's awesome, Barb and Fishaholic and IJ06. Cool. Welcome, everybody. So there's some Porcelia Scabber uh, party mix or morph mix or whatever you want to call it. Now let's take a look at the Porcelio Magnificus. And we've got Jay Bear, Ray Tripp in the house. Thanks for joining. I'm going to be seeing him later. We're going to, we've got a project we're working on together, which is going to be fun. Tell you more about that later. Make it Kate. Hello. Welcome. Kaler's Aquatics. Thank you. And Andrew Ewald and Scott H. Welcome. AJ Cud. Ah, thank you. An Insect Freak and the, the Rockner. And Kay Law Loves Cookies. Cool. Let's check it out. We're going to look at these Porcelio uh, Magnificus. Ooh. There is a male, looks like. Young male, I think that's what that is. Fairly long uropods. And I want to get down and see if we can see the monkey. I know I've shown some of you the monkey a while back, but let's see how they're doing. I noticed there's quite a few. It's bedtime o'clock here in Scotland. <laughs> and insect freaks. I do not have that species. Um, Sounds intriguing though. Okay, we're going to go dig in here for just a second. Get some leaf litter moved out of the way and see what we've got in terms of monkey. Oh, yep. A lot of them kicking around there. See some fungus nets and some springtails too. But I wanted to see if we could get an idea of how many clutches were going on just by different sizes of um, the Magnificus monkey. And I am seeing. I don't know what you're seeing here. That, that one's fairly small compared to that one, for example. So we've got multiple clutches going on. I don't know how many. I don't want to disturb it too much because I don't want to hurt anybody. But let's see. And Novsky, Novsky, nice to see you here. Welcome to a live stream. It's great that you've joined in. Um, let's see, I'm trying to get the buttons to work here. And the Rockner, how often do you change the millipede substrate? It depends on how many millipedes I have and the depth of the substrate and that kind of stuff. I think for a normal setup, shooting for every six months or so is probably good. And Andrew Ewald, I have probably, and it depends, the substrate on this side is pretty light. Substrate on the other side is heavier. Let's see if I can give you an idea of what that's like. I mean, there's a lot of leaves in here for sure. The substrate is probably up to 
close to three inches deep on the deepest part over here. Whereas over here on the damp end, it's, it's shallower. But uh, yeah, I do have a lot of leaves in there. Oh, there's a specimen right there, just halfway through a molt. I think it's pretty cool that isopods molt one half at a time. Pretty interesting way to uh, handle that issue of uh, the vulnerability of molting. Let's see. And Killer's Aquatic. First reptile this week, an Indonesian blue tongue skink. Great lizard. I agree. I haven't had one, but I've looked into them, and I think they're awesome. And uh, I think it's pretty hard to beat as a, as a first lizard, for sure. Or as a lizard at all. I'm going to be feeding the snake in a little while here. Might do it on the live stream, possibly. Um, okay. So hopefully the Rockner, I was able to answer the, yeah, I did answer that question and make it keep saying, heard your crickets chirping, thought one was loose in the room with me. Well, <coughs> excuse me. I'm really glad that you don't have to worry about a, a, a loose cricket because they can be a pain when they're loose. Um, so yeah, I sometimes get crickets loose in the house and nobody's very happy about that. So I think we're going to, put uh it's gonna be dinner time for this snake he's really active he's crawling around on my neck right now but he looks <laughs> yeah loose roaches are silent <laughs> <coughs> but i would get in a lot more trouble for a loose roach so that's why i don't keep them sorry about the cough folks it's not quite gone but i think maybe we're getting close here you go buddy Hmm. Okay. Oh, Scott H., you are so lucky that your cat loves crickets. Our cat is really bored of crickets, I guess. He just doesn't, doesn't go after them like some cats do. So I am jealous of your cats, that you have cats with sufficient predatory drive that they will tackle crickets. That's pretty awesome, i got to say. Okay. Just one second, folks. Got to set things down. I don't have my tripod handy at the moment, so that, that's nice and thawed. We're going to try feeding this guy. I think he's pretty hungry. Oh, yeah, he is. Look at that. He goes instantly interested. He's been striking. Well, yeah, he has been striking. Oh, right in the water bowl. I'm going to have to change the water now after the live stream. Don't want bacterial growth. Oh, did you see that? I think he got a little nervous there. I don't know if he was... Now, did I wash all the smell of the food off? I hope not. I've never done that before. Never dropped it in the, in the water dish. But he looks like he's fairly interested. He's been striking a lot uh, more intensely lately, which is not uncommon for corn snakes as they get older. They get, so they're attacking larger prey items that are a little more difficult to subdue maybe. So instead of just, uh, just swallowing it, they actually attack it. And eventually, maybe he'll actually start constricting. This is a quail and rabbit reptilink. So it's made of whole rabbit and whole quail, feathers, bones, all that. And it's not the only thing I feed he likes his mice, his frozen thawed mice too. But uh, this is a, a nice healthy food because it is a whole animal prey. And the fact that it's ground actually increases the caloric density um, so that this is a, as calorically dense as a mouse twice its size. I do give him two to two and three quarters of one of these every time I feed him though. Are you going to eat or are you just not into it right now? I don't know see what he does. Oh no, I think he might might do it. I wish I hadn't dropped it in the water, but I think he's gonna take it. I just don't know that he's gonna do a strike. It seems like whenever I don't film, he strikes like pretty intensely, and when I do film, he takes his sweet time. It's kind of funny, but I figured it couldn't hurt to uh, film him and see how he does. Um, all right, I'm gonna set down the tongs here and I think I can pull up the chat see we can see if he's gonna eat while we do this 
So, yeah. Make it Kate has a juvenile who really strikes and constricts it and looks at me like, what do I do with it now? So it kind of uh, hasn't quite figured out how the process connects, the transition. That's kind of funny. Um, so Selbo Smith, does he eat mice? We need him now if he does. There's some mice have entered the house and are hiding in the house and it's very hard to get rid of them. Oh, yeah. I could see that being difficult for sure. Let me see. I'm going to pull out the other reptile link here because I didn't drop that one in the water and he can probably smell it better so he might be more interested. I feel like he was more interested and then I dropped it in the water and that was dumb. Well there he goes. He's going to eat it anyway. Maybe. He's just not. Oh, maybe if I... He's funny. When, when I got him first, um, the former owner says she hates, he hates it when you move the food. Like, nobody can see. The, the glare is bad. Let me see if I can fix that. There, that's a little better. Um, said he hates it when you move the food at all, so I just put him in a container, let him sit there with his food, and leave him alone, and then he's fine. And he's gotten so that he will attack it. Oh, there he goes. Um, even when I'm wiggling it, often will attack it pretty aggressively, but not today. But he did at least try to pick it up, and then he dropped it, so that was awesome. It's a good thing you're not in the wild, buddy. That's all I can say. Who knows how that would go. Um, so yeah, he does eat mice. He really likes mice. Um, last time I gave him a frozen thawed mouth up, mouse, he had a really good feeding response. Last time I fed him reptilinks before this, he also had a really good feeding response. He's just not having a great one right now. But... At least it's a slow one. Um, so Rachel's reptiles, welcome. So your snake just gently takes it in leaves too. Yeah, ours will often do that. Ours will often do that. Although he, he does strike on occasion. And I think as he's getting to be more of an adult, he likes more wiggly food. Uh, but we'll see what he does today. He's been pretty active, so... I'm kind of surprised that he's not more interested in the food. We might have to move on to something else and come back and see if he's finished it off. But a lot of times he'll really just chase it around. It's crazy. That he's, he's really not doing a whole lot right now, huh? Well, I'm glad that it can be fascinating at a safe distance, Mike. That's probably part of it. But you never know. You may eventually lose your discomfort with snakes. It happens. A lot of people, uh, you know, you just start by watching videos. That, that can make a difference. You can get kind of desensitized, so to speak. And here I am shading everything. Sorry, folks. Here he goes. Maybe he's going to take it now, huh? Let's see if he does it. Oh, there he goes. He's going to swallow that thing down. It's, it's really fascinating to me to watch them swallow. It never ceases to amaze me at the flexibility of their jaws. Just the entire process is absolutely fascinating. How they're able to navigate, if it's a mouse, navigating the limbs. And if it's uh, something else, like a reptilian, how they navigate the little tie-offs. And they, they manage to get on a good end for swallowing and everything. It's pretty amazing. And huh, maybe that's it, Scott H. Maybe he's just got a little stage fright. Who knows? And... Novsky, you got to tell me how to say your name. I don't want to. I don't want to mispronounce your name. I want to do it justice. So is it Novsky, Novsky? How do you say it? Um, I would love to know. But yeah, he's a pretty gentle snake, even when he's eating. At least this time. And yes, Isoviva is in the house as well. Nice to see you here. And we have some success. Yes, Stephen Grenzo. Good evening. And down the wormhole. Hello. Welcome. I'm going to try warming up this other one that I accidentally dropped in his water dish. Sad that I had just cleaned the water dish too. Just scrubbed it out and then dropped his food in it. So I don't really feel like I should uh, leave that in there. I need to take it out and wash it again. He is big enough now that he really does need two of these. He finishes them off pretty fast. And these are, like I mentioned, calorically more dense than a mouse of similar size, so he's getting a pretty decent meal when he has two of these. And make it Kate. 
Um, the copper in the water bowl trick, I haven't tried that. I remember that was on uh, Snake Discovery and I found it a pretty interesting trick. Uh, and for those of you who haven't heard about it, if you put, like you drop a penny in the water bowl, um, what happens is that a little bit of that copper dissolves and it makes it so that, uh, I believe it can have some antimicrobial properties, but one of the main things that it does is that if your snake happens to release some uh, urine in the bowl, then it changes color, it changes blue. Uh, there's a chemical reaction that causes it to change blue, so you know, oh, you better change the water in a hurry. So it's pretty cool, um, but I haven't tried it yet. So Stephen Grenzo, you were just talking about streaming your home critters, and then I'm doing the same thing, cool. So what kind of critters do you have, Stephen? Um, Nofsuke, like that? Tell me if I just said it right, because that's, that's what I'm reading, so I hope I, hope I got it. And down the worm, wormhole. You know, I wonder about that too. Um, I was a little bit concerned about too much copper as well, uh, but if, you know, Emily of uh, Snake Discovery does it, she's, she has a lot of experience with snakes and she's really successful with them, so I guess she's not having issues with that. Okay, let's see if he's ready for another link now. Are you ready? You ready for this? A lot of snakes get get really hungry right after they eat. Ooh, it looks like he might be priming up for a strike here. We'll get some more serious action, huh? Oh, was that a false alarm? Is that what that was? Is that what it was, my friend? Not, you're wearing a hat. You know, jumping spiders wear water droplets as hats, and apparently corn snakes wear aspen shavings as hats. I don't think the effect is quite as attractive, but you know, corn snakes are always cute, even without a hat, so I guess they don't need it. Um, let's see. So make it, Kate's been doing it, that's cool. Oh, that makes sense, that you have to make sure it's the right pennies. Um, some, the, they've changed the formulation of pennies over the years, that's, that's true. So, it makes sense you'd have to think about that. But, make it, Kate's using scrap copper, so that's like a different thing. Okay, let's see. Um, Alright. Oh, right, I got it, Novsky. Cool, awesome. I'll remember that now. Cool. And... Does this apply only to snakes? My blue tongue occasionally goes in his water dish. I imagine it would work for most reptiles. And does Santa deliver snakes? I would hope so. I've never gotten one for Christmas, but my garter snakes were essentially my birthday present to myself. My late birthday present to myself. So, that's not quite the same, I guess. Oh, that was an abortive attempt. <coughs> it looks like he's lost his hat. Um, and make it Kate, like it would take a chemical reaction for the copper to dissolve enough in the water to affect them, you notice a change in the color of the copper itself. That makes sense. So Stephen Grenzo has three beardies, two leather, one normal, one crested, one corn, one western hognose, one Kenyan sand boa, some of them a lot prettier than others, also a guinea pig and a cat in a Singapore shrimp tank. Nice. That's a nice little menagerie going on. Oh, he got it. There goes Reptilink number two, going down. Enrique, hello. Four dub, nice to see you here as well. Things are going well. He's a beautiful snake, isn't he? And your zebras just had babies, awesome. I'm glad, that is awesome, those are so cool. Um, Dragon Udo just got some adult breeder dubias, and I gotta say they're much bigger than I thought. Yeah, they're pretty big, those dubias. And how many times do a week do you feed? I only feed this guy once a week at his age. Um, when he gets older, I'll take that down to about once every two weeks, approximately. Uh, when he gets up to 400 grams or so, he's only, he's pushing 300 right now, almost there. And at 400 grams, I'm going to take him down to 
every two weeks. But uh, my baby garter snakes, because they're babies and because garter snakes have higher metabolisms than most snakes, they get food twice a week. Um, when they were really, when I first got them, I was feeding them more often than that. But they're now at um, twice a week. So usually I do a feeding of reptilinks and a feeding of pinkies or uh, earthworms. Now it's getting a little hard to find earthworms around here though, so I'm kind of tapering off on the earthworms for now. Once it's easier to catch them again, I'll be adding them back into the diet. And I usually supplement the earthworms with a calcium vitamin supplement too. So, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to switch this over. Um, if I can get his, his lid back on, now he's eaten. I'm going to put his lid back on and we're going to go to the other room and feed something else. Good job, buddy. Took care of your dinner. And even though they weren't exactly exciting takedowns, so I'm still glad to see you eat. Did a good job. All right, here we go. Switch over to the other view, and I always manage to put my hand in front of the camera, don't I? I don't know why. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Okay, so here we go. Switching over to the frogs. It's time to check it out. So how do you say your name? Con Con Condes? Condace? I don't know. Just want to tell you I ordered my first bunch of isopods, zebras. Excellent choice. Those are among, certainly in my top five favorite isopods, probably in my top two, honestly, uh, of isopods for beginners. They're super cool. You can't do a lot better than that, so awesome. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Scrolling back. So, Mrs. Kell, trying to watch your video. My frogs are croaking so loudly in the background. What kind of frogs do you have? These are my bumblebee dart frogs. Oh, she's hungry, isn't she? She's jumping on it. I'm going to put some more down here. See the male. See if he'll come have a snack. Um, better put the lid on. And make sure that's nice and sealed. And we'll watch them eat dinner for a minute on these lovely liverworts that uh, Heather sent me. So I try to catch up with the chat. Let's see. Oh, Enrique, that's cool. Corn snake, cobra do milho. That's cool. And in Portuguese, that's how you say it. I didn't know that. I just learned how to say um, corn snake in Portuguese. Cobra do milho. I probably pronounced it a little bit wrong, but I'm trying. My sauces are kind of expensive. They can be, but the fact that they're calorically more dense, gram for gram, they're not as expensive as you might think. And make it cake. Me too. I love that. Watching them do the little wiggle as they push the food down. It's awesome. And he, he he's vibing. <laughs> Tammy Terrell. <coughs> <coughs> Welcome. Mm, sorry. You're going to get a vinegaroon. That's awesome. And you're in the UK. That's nice. Are you getting a giant vinegaroon, like the ones from the US? That's cool that they have them available there. I know you can captive breed them, so that kind of makes sense. Um, Chirinha, Vici, essa bicha, ela matava na hora papai. I only understand about half of that, and you might have to translate for me. I got part of it. If somebody saw this little beast, he would kill it in the time of something. That's that's about where I am on that one. Um, so, make it Kate, Uncle Jim's worm farm. That's true. I could order some, and you have to be careful when you're ordering worms. Uh, for snakes because, for garter snakes specifically, they can't have the red wigglers, but they can have night crawlers. And as far as I know, I've been trying to research this, I think they can have the Indian blue worms or the jumping worms, but I'm not entirely sure about that. So, and Stephen Grenzo, do you guys do millipedes? Been trying to find a for source for some unsuccessfully. I do have millipedes, um, and I just um, shut down live shipping pretty much for the winter. Uh, unless 
I, I will still do occasional orders uh, express, but that's 45 bucks, so not everybody wants to do that. But I have shut down priority shipping for the winter until February, but I do sell them. Um, I do sell some millipedes. Right now, the only ones, well, in February, the only ones I'd have available would probably be um, Hiltonius pulchris, ivory millipedes, and maybe bumblebees. Um, and RJ Robinson, glad to hear it. I love feedings too. Really the fun of owning some of these animals, a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it comes from watching them eat. I just get a kick out of the frogs and their toe tapping. I don't know if any of you have seen the, how the frogs tap their toes when they're hunting a lot of the time. Specifically their back toes mostly, but it's funny to watch them do it. They don't always do it, but it's really funny when they do. Um, let's see. So... Kondase. Cool. All right. I can remember that. And Dragon Udo. Yeah, it's, it is kind of funny that they made sausages for reptiles, and this is the thing. This company is not the first company to do it. Other companies have done it in the past, but I think there was one called Snake Sausages that I read about back in like the early 90s, I think, in Reptile and Amphibian Magazine at the time. I thought, oh, that's cool. And from what I understand, it was a pretty good product at first, but then the product company got sold and somebody started, oh, he's tapping his toe, the male, the one in the middle of the screen was tapping his toe just now as he was hunting. I don't know if you saw that. Anyway, um, yeah, they, so the company got sold and the product declined in quality and kind of gave them a bad name. So there are people who are adamant that they're awful things, but they've been doing our corn snake a lot of good and our garter snakes are obviously doing well on them so far, but the corn snake's been eating them for about a year and doing great on them and it's not the only food he's eaten that whole time but uh, doing well so how often should zebras have babies um, that is a good question I'm not sure how many clutches they have per year or anything like that they just I would say they, they have several though per year I don't even know that's a good question I wonder if research has been done on that I just get a ton of zebra babies all the time so I haven't really counted them Oh, Pacific Chorus Frogs, cool. That's an awesome looking dart frog. Reminds me of Wiz Khalifa's song, Black and Yellow. Well, that's appropriate. We've got a black and yellow frog here. I don't know the song, but there you go. That's true. Yeah, that's a word I did know, Enrique. Uh, um, it's huh. It's hard to say. Huh? Did I say it right? Jumping worms. Yeah, there's a species of worm. They have various names, but one of them is jumping worm because of the way they move, and uh, they're invasive in some spe places in the south. They're a little bit less cold tolerant than a lot of others. They have other names too, but uh, I think that is actually the type that I cultured in Hawaii because you can't get red wigglers there, but I was able to get some of the Indian blue worms, and I fed them to my puffers and my coolie loaches and my, uh, what else did I feed them to? My goldfish ate them stuff like that. Um, they were pretty, pretty versatile. I did vermicomposting, but I also just fed off some of the excess to my, to my fish. And I specifically for my little dwarf puffer, because he would eat the, the moina and the scuds and stuff, but, and the snails, but it was hard keeping him full unless I supplemented it with other things. So I'd give him those two, the little baby worms. He liked those. Reptile fish and fish short getting some line day geckos. For 12 by 12 by 18 exoterra. Awesome. Love day geckos. Want to get some of those. And RJ Robinson got ivory millipedes last weekend. Definitely one of my favorite millipedes. Steven Grenzo trying to decide what to do millipede wise. Do some of the larger species, plant the enclosure, let it grow out over winter. Cool. So, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. I do recommend uh, ivory millipedes if you can get them. They're great, one of the best species. And fishaholic, I'm breeding haggis. Does that mean uh, you're actually breeding sheep? Because isn't haggis made of sheep stomach? Oh, do I raise pill millipedes? I don't. Uh, I would like to try some of the glomerus species. They're the small ones that'll actually breed in captivity. So I would love to do that, but uh, never have. And 
Quinn, Hana, are bumblebee millipedes good for beginners? They're not bad as long as you can keep them warm enough. They're, they're really good in terms of breeding. They're n really nicely colored. They're a little small, but they're, as long as you can keep them warm enough, keep them between say 72 and 80 Fahrenheit. They're happy as a clam, they'll breed for you. They're pretty undemanding. If you can't keep them that warm, I wouldn't recommend getting them. They don't do so hot when it's cooler. Um, and do they jump? The, the jumping worms kind of, they thrash about wildly. So jumping might be not exactly the right word, but they thrash about pretty wildly sometimes. Plus they can hop out. Uh, they tend to leave a place that they, is not to their liking. Rather than staying in the substrate, they'll all climb up and try to find a way out of it. I think that's part of where they get their name too. So Salvo Smith, I was wondering, are your chickens suffering the cold climate in the winter being outside? Not so much because they have, their coop is, is pretty well, uh, it helps protect them. And also they are all heavy bodied chickens that we got knowing that they would be, uh, most of them are heavy bodied chickens and all of them are cold tolerant chickens. When we were researching the types that we got, we made sure that they were cold tolerant varieties that do so well. So yeah. Um, and let's see. Enrique has wild bettas. Awesome. Which species? And RJ, have I kept Cal Halloween crabs? I have not. They seem interesting though. I've seen them around in the shops once in a while. And Enrique, thanks for joining. Um, fish all like I've got a better Scottish accent than me. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hmm. Mrs. Kel one, do you... Any Black Friday shopping for your animals? I made a Josh Frog's order for some plants and blue bottle fly spikes. I have occasionally. I don't think I really did this time. Did I? Well, that's not true. I guess I bought some, uh, I bought some bug jelly from Bugs in Cyberspace. I wanted to try out some of the commercial bug jellies. So that's what, I'm, that's what I did. I guess that's all I bought for Black Friday. So, Soto 247, hey. Quinn, I live in Arizona, so warm is not an issue. Yeah, that makes sense. Pretty warm place. So, Breaker, how is the blue death fanning bee babies doing? They're doing pretty well. Still waiting for them to get up to the size of uh, pupation, but they're not quite there yet. I think there's some of them, they're slightly more than halfway there. But yeah. yeah let's take a look inside the habitat now. I'm going to scare away the frogs a little bit. To see how things are doing. Some moss in the corner, a couple of bromeliads. This one flowered a while ago. I think I posted that on my Instagram account. This patch of liverwort is doing really well here. And the um, oak leaf fig I put in there is starting to do stuff. And there's a little selaginella growing that I didn't plant there. And this patch of liverwort is doing nicely too. A lot of moss coming out of that. Some baby lemon button fern. The uh, Rabbit's foot fern doing well. My little orchid just flowering here. This is, I've had this orchid for years. It used to be in with my morning geckos and I moved it. I think I might move it back. It does okay in here, but I think it likes it slightly drier. It does a little bit better. And then here's some more selaginella and some more lemon button fern. There's possibly my favorite Neoregelia bromeliad back in the corner. I love the color, the little polka dots on that one. And then that moss needs to be watered back there. It's not doing so hot. And then over here, got some sphagnum peat moss that decided to grow. And then the, the fern is kind of covering it up. So it's not doing as well as it was, but it's still alive back there. So that's kind of fun. Look at that. Look at this liverwort. I just love this stuff. Every kind of liverwort. I used to grow it in, uh, you know, that Suswasser tongue, the underwater stuff. They used to call it Pelia back in the day when I grew it. I would grow and sell it, but uh, I don't have any anymore. In Hawaii, I used to produce a fair bit of it, but not not so anymore. But anyway, I love liverworts. They're fun. Um, so, let's see. So, yes. Thank you, Elaine. Glad you're enjoying this habitat in the frogs. I have had fun with it. This was a family project when we built this thing. Um, we did it over a couple of months in the summer and all the kids helped with 
and my wife, of course, helped with the design uh, and the layout with, we were siliconing things. The, it was really, really fun to all do it together. Right? And I think it came out pretty well. Um, let's see, I'm never quite satisfied with the way my escapes turn out, but I, I like it. It's, I would just say, I don't think it's perfect, but I do like it a lot. So, and that's not the fault of anybody who helped me. That's just, you know, um, I feel like whenever I'm doing it, I feel like I don't have enough space to do what I want to do. And then I realize, oh, I should have gotten one that's twice that size, but I didn't. And that's, that's what I'm talking about, I guess. So, oh, you know, break your vampire crabs. I would totally do vampire crabs someday. I love those things. And Rachel's Reptiles got an enclosure from Isoviva for Black Friday. Awesome. That'll be great for your zebras. And you're welcome, Breaker. And Brant. Um, thank you. I'm glad you enjoy the videos and the dart frogs. And I do culture my own fruit flies. I culture, I probably have 10, 12 cultures going right now. I, I sell off a fair bit of the cultures too. So yes. And thanks, Fishaholic, for joining in. I really appreciate it. And Brian Orr, ever tried giant West African land snails? I have a 12-year-old I named Hercules. I got Got here, she had a month old. Well, that's pretty awesome. Um, those are illegal in my area, unfortunately. I have uh, had experiences with them in Hawaii because they are feral in Hawaii. They're in, considered invasive there. But I thought they were really cool. So I would encounter them in the wild a lot there in Hawaii on the island of Oahu. But uh, they're illegal to keep, so I, I don't have any, but... If they weren't illegal, I'd probably consider it because they're pretty cool. Austin Payne, nice to see you here. Oh, awesome, you have baby Porcelio Bolivari in the enclosure. Congratulations on that, that's awesome. So, RJ Robinson, Halloween crabs are fun. Not enough keepers them and a lack of information. So, I'm glad yours are doing well, that's great. Yeah, they're, they're pretty cool little creatures. Well, they're not, not, not all that little, I guess, but they're, they're pretty cool. I love it when they climb up. I really tried to design the uh, cork structure so that they could climb up and utilize the space, and they do. They're all over this. They're, I find them up in the corners. I find them everywhere, so it's working. That, the design actually works pretty well. All right. Well, I'm looking at the time. I am going to have to... Uh, call it good in just a minute here. I really appreciate everybody joining in. Thank you for the joining the frog feeding, the isopod updates, and the uh, snake feeding. And Elaine Smith, I'm with you. Turtle and frogaholic, that's, that's awesome. And I better go now, uh, but everybody have a great night and see you soon.